Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to our thought for the day. I hope you're having a good week. We've finally reached Friday. Um, it's been very hot this week, so I hope you've looked after yourselves well. And um, don't forget, on Sunday, our live stream service at half past 10, which you can watch on YouTube or Facebook. Don't forget, all of next week, we'll have another week of thoughts for the day, but that will probably be it for a while. Obviously, if there's any form of lockdown again, we'll, we'll carry on, but we're going to focus on our Sunday mornings and hopefully going back into our building, but always some news on that um, soon. Look out for that. All this week, we've been looking at the covenants that there are across the Bible. And there are four covenants in the Old Testament. The covenants are that voluntary relationship where two parties into into, making promises that they are going to keep voluntarily. And we've uh, seen a great lot of things this week, haven't we? And what's really interesting is the Old Testament unfolds, the, the kind of speed between those covenants picks up and the, the sort of promises kind of link together. And, and there's this real great sense of expectation across the pages of the Old Testament um, the possibilities for the future, what God's going to do, what God promises to do. Um, and as you go across the Old Testament, it becomes quite an exciting moment as you look towards and, and begin to believe, certainly through the reign of David, it begins to fill within touch and distance that Israel are going to be all that they promised to be or that God has promised they're going to be. And those covenants to Abraham, particularly and at Sinai, and now obviously with David yesterday, are just almost kind of on spitting distance, if you like. And it's going to be this almost reality Sadly, however, as the story unfolds from the life of David and then the life of his son Solomon, actually the picture of Israel uh, and its potential unravels. And so in as much as the Old Testament ends with this great crescendo of expectation of this Messiah figure, this Davidic king that we spoke of yesterday, it also ends with a great sense of tragedy as God's people Israel, who are supposed to be a nation of priests, that treasured possession, fail. They break the covenant at Sinai. They become the very opposite of what God calls them to be. They find themselves, they, they tolerate injustices. They worship other gods. They break the commands of God over and over and over deliberately as well. If you read a book like Ezekiel, it paints a very, very terrible picture of the heart of God's people. And so by the end of the book, they're losing their land. They're going into exile and it's all a bit rubbish. It's all a bit awful. It's all not quiet. Um, the euphoric expectation of those earlier covenants to David and Abraham um, and at Mount Sinai and even Noah as well. And yet, as it all kind of unravels, you get another group of people called the prophets. And the prophets, um, as the Old Testament unfolds, begin to speak of one more covenant. As those four promise so much and ultimately God's people break them liberally and routinely, the prophets begin to speak of this new covenant, that God is going to, at some point in the future, make one more covenant with the world, with his people, with creation, a new covenant that's going to be materially different in some ways to all the others, but actually fulfill and accomplish what they all have set out previously. Jeremiah chapter 31 speaks of this new covenant hope in the future. Let me read those verses to you now. Jeremiah 31 from verse 31 says this, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach each other, they will teach their neighbour or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. And he goes on to mention some other points to that. But it's interesting that as kind of that covenant faithfulness is broken from the Israelite end and God keeps his faithfulness. These prophets begin to speak into that and talk of this day when God will make a new covenant where no longer will it be full of rituals and ritualistic, but God's going to do something internally. Ezekiel speaks of a time in the future which is linked to this when God is going to change people's hearts of stone and make them hearts of flesh, living hearts, put their his spirit within them. And actually, even some of the language I just read to you in uh, Jeremiah 31, you may recognise as language and phrases used in the New Testament. And so then into that reality 
comes Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, born king of the Jews, born in the line of Abraham, in the line of David, who will be, because he is sinless, the perfect Israelite, obedient to that Sinai covenant without any sin whatsoever. As Jesus enters our world, we soon realise that he is the king sent by God. He is the perfect Israelite. He is the one that God is going to accomplish all those other four promises through. And in fact, then when we think of what happens in Jeremiah 31 and the book of Ezekiel, we realise very quickly that this new covenant is going to be ratified and made through him, through his obedience, through his life, through his example, and ultimately through his death and resurrection on the cross. And in fact, at the Last Supper, before Jesus was taken off to that cross, as he took the bread and took the cup, he says these words. He says, says, take and eat, this is my body. And we read in verse 27 of Matthew 26, he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. I will tell you, I will not drink from the fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Through Jesus, all those promises of land and universal blessing and a king who will be on the throne forever come down to him. He is the fulcrum, the centre point of civilization, as someone famously once said. He is the hinge point of everything. Everything before has been leading to his life and his work and then everything since actually is in light of his death and resurrection. Those covenant promises are now yes in Christ. And they're ours to be enjoyed through faith in him. Because he is no ordinary man. He's fully man and fully God. And as the God man, as an old fashioned way of putting it, is the fully God, fully man in this person of Jesus Christ. He is uniquely able to fulfill our obligations to those covenants and God's. And he stands in between the two. And if we're in Christ through faith, then we actually then, through his obedience, then are able to stand with God complete, perfect in his presence. We're able to enjoy the blessings of God through Christ's obedience on our behalf. His death and resurrection then achieve for us what we could never do through our good actions because we're not good enough. He does for us what we cannot do and therefore we are able to finally enjoy that partnership again which all these covenants have been pointing to, that covenant relationship where we often break with Jesus keeps for us and God is faithful too and we're able to know God perfectly for the first time and then forever. And so then we look forward one more time, not to another covenant, but to the culmination of everything God has done. We look forward to the book of Revelation, and we see that moment when every tribe and every tongue and every nation, those who put their faith in this perfect Israelite, and we see all of us standing together in the kingdom of God before our perfect Father. All that expectation even with the disappointment of Israel, actually through Jesus comes back and crescendos to the point of new creation and we stand perfect and holy in God's kingdom. How wonderful it is to be a child of the living God. How wonderful it is to be a part of God's family. How wonderful it is to have all those promises and know them as yes in Christ. How wonderful it is to know that I don't have to be perfect to know the blessings of God, how wonderful it is to know the love of God and his faithfulness that is unfailing, not because of anything I could possibly do, but because his grace in sending his son to be like a man, a perfect man and God at the same time. So that through faith in his death and his resurrection and the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, I can have that new heart, I can have that law written on my heart and my mind. I can know God personally. It's relaxing and it's free and it's liberating and it's open to you. And if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, today is the first day of the rest of your life. Ask him into your life, even now. Say, Lord Jesus, come into my life. Be my Lord and my Saviour. I turn from my sin. I turn from a life where I fought you. I now want to love you and follow you. Make that your prayer now and ask him into your life. And enjoy the blessings of that covenant relationship we've looked at this week. Have a fantastic weekend. Tune in Sunday at half past ten and we look forward to seeing you then. God bless.